Good morning, guys. Uh, thank you for thank you for coming. Um, hope you're on the right session. Uh, a little bit of introduction. Uh, my name is Igor Donev, um, manager infrastructure operations within network. Uh, we cover network and systems operations. But I've worked in the networking team within Red Hat as a network engineer for 10 years or so. So I've come from there and I'm more or less managing the, the same team or more or less my experience. So I've, I, I wanna show our journey from both views as, as, as a person using, using the tools and transforming the stuff and also as a manager helping promote the tool and, 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 and have it adopted. Uh, and with me, I have, uh, I have Martin Mouchka as well. Yeah, hello, uh, my name is Martin Mouchka. Um, I work as a network engineer in Red Hat for almost, well, more than five years now. Um, lately focusing on network automation and monitoring. <coughs> and um, I am here to more or less do the technical part of the talk. So as, as, as Martin said, uh, I will cover the journey and then more or less <laughs> show us where we are currently, uh, then follow up with the demo and the capabilities of, of the tool and the platform we've, we've developed. And also there should be some, uh, there, there should be some time for Q&A as well. Um, I'm just wondering uh, how, how much of the folks here are actually you know, network engineers and working a lot on the, on the networking part with configuring and, and you know, managing network devices. Okay. Any, any managers in the room? Okay. Cool. More or less, that's what I expected. So, uh, anyway, um, let's start. So, I have a nice slide about a road and a journey. More or less, uh, these are some of the milestones or the steps or stages that I think uh, we've been through as a team in order to get to the place where where we should be. Uh, and again. Uh, these are our milestones, the way that we see it. Uh, it might not be the same for anyone else, but the whole point of this presentation for us was to kind of show what we've been through and maybe helpful for other folks and other teams and other companies in order if they're going to the, to the same uh, transformation of, of the networking within their, within their team. So as, as any other uh, journey, it usually starts with the manual stuff where you're actually doing everything manually, which is a place where Hopefully you don't want to be. It's a place probably, I'm assuming, in early stages of, of a personal career or an early stages of when a company starts. Uh, as a network engineer, you are actually usually uh, tasked to do uh, deployments of, for example, like a new data center, new lab, new office infrastructure, and whatnot. And that is a, is a time drain, especially when you, think, when you do things manually. If you do things manually, uh, just generating the configuration is usually uh, using some gold, golden configurations or copy-paste from a previous device and kind of trying to change that. And that's, that's very error-prone because uh, using, reusing, a, reusing a previous configuration can cause problems because of different software versions, maybe a different, uh, uh, you, need, you need an edge switch versus an access switch or a core, stuff like that. So, uh, just generating the configuration for multiple devices usually takes a lot of time, and once you're trying to deploy it, you run into a lot of, you know, a lot of errors. Um, also, the part about deployment is usually manual. You copy and paste. You, you copy the generation you've come and paste it directly via, via console access to the device. And again, that's a place where uh, it creates a lot of errors: copy-paste errors, uh, configuration errors. Uh, you're hitting limitations of the out-of-band management if you're using out-of-band not the console, like some buffer errors and stuff like that. So the whole thing is kind of cumbersome. It takes a lot of time and stuff that you really would like, you know, not to, not to spend. And it's, and it's frustrating for you because you're, you're wasting a lot of time. And with incoming work of a lot more of those projects, you kinda, you're kind of becoming the blocker for, for the larger uh, delivery of the project. And with that, you actually don't have no configuration management. You are actually constantly doing something, something manually. And then the next step in order how to fix that, help yourself make sure that you are delivering faster. You are focusing on, okay, let's, let's generate the configuration. Let's, let's, do, let's do that part faster. Because that's kind of the, 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 the first milestone, the first part that you want to focus on. In order to do that, you actually 
what, that's what we did. You actually have to have like standards in place, like decide how are we going to configure our devices. What does an edge switch look like? What does a core switch look like? A router, whatever. How do we configure spanning tree? How do how do we configure BGP? What's our um, security access list? What are authentication methods and stuff like that? And once you have those, then you can easily develop a tool that can actually generate a configuration for you. It you put a you know I put a host name. You put what you use the switch for, and it generates the whole configuration. Uh, and then you have you've narrowed your work to, uh, to only the deployment part, which is, again, still usually manual. Uh, so you've, you've halved your, your toil in a bit, so you're kind of doing it, doing it faster because um, people can easily generate a configuration. With that, actually, you are covering a good portion of, of, of having your tool to be used within your team because if, if you're making it easier for someone, your team will start using it. With that, also, you are standardizing the, 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 the thing that helps uh, making sure your infrastructure is scalable because if you're using a tool to standardize everything, then it's easily supportable. Then you, you don't have any special quirks here and there that you need only the local guy to fix, but anyone can fix any problems in any, any, any parts of the infrastructure. And again, there is an early adoption because people, people save time. With that, the next logical step is you know, the, the automated deployment. You figure out how, okay, now I fixed the configuration, but still on deployment, I need to do it manually. I need to copy and paste. Again, small, some of those, some of those issue, issue, issues, you're still having it. And that's the part where you're actually, you're, you're, you are still slow at. And that's the part where we actually, um, we made um, our out-of-band out management platform actually uh, supported in this, in this platform. And with that, you can actually, uh, without manual deployment, we can, we, can, we can use the tool to actually deploy the, the configuration. With that, we, we, we do deployments in a matter of minutes rather than you know, days or, 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 or hours. So with that, we can, we've shortened the time to deploy an office or a lab or a data center you know, from days or weeks to actually you know, hours or minutes. That actually you know, gives another boost of people actually using the tool because now it's, again, it's, it's a time saver from the rest of the team. You can have the perfect tool, you know, but if no one uses it, it's, 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 you know, it's, it's a shame. So that's where, as part of the manager, is kind of you know, having, having um, uh, uh, kind of introducing this, why we're doing it, and, and, and telling the folks that it's a time saver for them. And also the large benefit is that we're in the background, we're having things standardized, it's easier for us to actually support and all of that stuff. And with that, you have configuration management in, in, the, in the first sense. People are using it, but they're using it only for, for you know, um, greenfield development, only for the new stuff, only for the new offices, for the new data centers, for the new, for the new labs. But whenever they need to change something there, they actually do it manually. So that, that's the... Uh, that's the disconnect that, that we, we used to have. We, we have the people using the tool for the initial deployments, but then whenever they need to change, it's, uh, it's, they do it manually. And that's the, that's the, I think for us, it was the most trickiest, trickiest way to actually change the mindset of the people that, hey guys, now that we have this great tool, let's use it for everything. Let's use it for actually doing the, doing the continuous changes as well. And with that, when you do that, actually, and that was a tricky part because it was, it is kind of the changing the mindset of the people. You know, the manual step, you have a, a, a pure network engineer, person who really likes configuring devices, network devices. You wake them up and they know how to configure BGP, routing, spanning tree. And then at the, at the end of this step, you kind of have that guy, but also with skill set, like using, using some Python, some scripting in order to have the platform that helps automate the stuff also uh, to have some knowledge in order for that. So that guy is actually participating into the tool, making sure we're, when we're adding new features, they actually can actually work and, and help as well. So it's, it's a mindset for people that they need to upgrade some of the skill set. And that's, that's the, that's, from a management point, that's kind of the, 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 the hardest part. And also it's frustrating for, for people that don't use the tool because they, they, have, a, they have a gap, rather. We, we had to present a lot, kind of introduce them how to use the tool, 
um, help them with uh, picking up some of the skills like Python or, uh, or, or Git, how to, how to make sure that they don't feel threatened and they can actually use the tool for, for everything. And once you're, once you're done in situation, you can actually you know, do a lot more. So back at the first slide. Um, just want to show where, where currently we are. We are actually somewhere between four and five, more or less, I, I would assume, uh, closing, closing to five. Um, uh, we've made a lot of progress. I mean, I don't, in the last 12, year, 12 months, I think we've come somewhere from here to that place. We weren't that bad 12 months ago, that, that's good. But it's a, again, it's a, it's a mindset change that we have, to, we have to fight as well, not just building the tool, but also making sure that people are really, really using it. And this is the current status, for example. Um, this is actually uh, pretty accurate. We, we have it updated yesterday. Uh, this is some of our vendors. Um, Open Gear is our out of band management. And that, as you can see, that's 100% covered. That's the part where it actually helps us a lot to, to increase the speed of the, of the delivery. Uh, we focused largely on the Juniper devices, the, 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 the switching and routing devices that we have. That was because they were mainly the low hanging fruit of the stuff that we can actually um, get, the, get the biggest benefit from. And we are more or less at 70%. Uh, we are currently narrowing down that a lot. On the Cisco side, we have not focused a lot, but that's, that's changing. Um, one of the things that uh, for us, for, for any operations team is the firewall infrastructure and you know, changing access list and whatnot. And that's something that we are currently developing a, a tool in order how to, that, to help us do, to manage that and, and help us there. So that's something that we will, uh, we, will be a focus for us in the, in the, next, in the next year. So, what does self-healing mean? I mean, self-healing more or less means a lot to different people. For us, it means that automation and monitoring to address alerts and fix operational issues. The way that I see it, um, you know, you have different protocols to, do, to figure out different problems as, as you know, to, to, to address, but some of them are, are, are limited or or uh, the solution in order to fix a problem can be a really expensive and proprietary and whatnot. So a, a, a good example is the first one, the switching loop. You have a protocol for switching loop, you have spanning tree protocol, and it's, it's pretty uh, well known how to do that, uh, how to protect your switching environment. You have the BPD guard, root guards and whatnot. But in a given lab environment, when you kind of, people are doing uh, weird stuff, because they need to, they are actually, it's a lab, they are actually testing a lot of stuff. There are, there are scenarios when loops just happen. And troubleshooting loops are not fun. Uh, I, can, I can tell you that. Um, and that's, that's the stuff where this tool can help, especially when the alerting can notice that there is a high CPU on a switch, and it can then do, do some steps in order to identify the root cause. It's usually finding the finding the port that is causing it and more or less shutting it down. Uh, another example is dual home WAN. We have two links for an office. Um, there is packet loss. Uh, BGP doesn't see that. It's not enough for it to bounce, to shut down, so that you still, have, you still have traffic flowing on one link. And more or less, the alert sees that there is a packet loss and can make a, make a logical decision that, OK, the other link is operational. We can shut it down, and then more or less, Send, send the ticket or actually you know, inform the, the, the knock that they can actually go and follow up with the vendor. Um, similar example as security related, the, the automation and the monitoring can see a DDoS-like attack and check who is doing it, can, can make a logical decision about what to block and where. Uh, and this is not regarding self-healing, but also the having the full uh, Infrastructure, the full network infrastructure managed can help you a lot regarding automating some tedious stuff like uh, software maintenance upgrades, especially with uh, the recent years where we actually have those exploits more or less more frequent or more or less on weekly or daily basis. That's something that can help. And also, once you, you have everything managed, that 
that gives you a source of truth on how your infrastructure is configured and you can use that in order to to have you know asset management you have the inventory you have all the all the gear there you, you know which devices running which software version and stuff like that so you can do a lot more a lot more data with that and again um, what are the steps that we have done in order to in order to do that uh, we are, haven't finished everything and that's something that we want to we want to continue moving forward we have the, we have our network automation platform uh, connected with Ansible Tower. So far, when someone wants to deploy something, it usually runs from their laptop or desktop. And we want to centralize that with Ansible Tower, with that allowing us to do a lot more and not relying on a, on a, given, on a given laptop, but more or less checking if there, is, there are changes and then do deployments and, 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 and other stuff. Also, the network monitoring part. The, the old way of doing monitoring was you you put a, you know, a new infrastructure, you switch somewhere, and then you need to do kind of manual add the switch to two or three you know, monitoring products that you have, which is a tedious work. Nobody likes that. People, when are busy, they usually forget that. And then you end up in a situation where you have something in production, but it's not monitored, and it kind of bites, bites, bites you up in the end. And that's what we're trying to fix with, uh, and that's what we fixed, and we'll show in the demo where the tool actually are automatic, the tool actually connects with the network monitoring. When the moment you add a new device, the moment you deploy a new infrastructure, it actually shows up in the network monitoring. And vice versa, if you remove it, it's actually gone and you don't need to worry about it anymore. Um, steps that we need to do is the uh, you know, event-driven automation, stuff that, that will help us connect all those three together, our platform, our you know, Ansible Tower and our network monitoring to make sure when there is an event, okay, how can we make this event actionable? How can we use the tool and the standard and infrastructure to actually self-heal or do something, do something smart? And um, the continuing making sure the, the, the full infrastructure is standardized, something that is probably gonna take a lot of time. Currently, as, as we showed on the, on the statistics page, um, we have, we have gaps, we only have more or less newly built infrastructure, fully managed, and that, that actually takes time. So now, for example, when we are actually gonna proceed with this, we can do the self-healing only in a limited uh, fraction of the, of the infrastructure, and that's something that will probably, probably take quite some time. Some old stuff that need to die, and with the adoption, and, and us constantly using the, the tool to actually um, you know, develop and uh, uh, deploy new stuff, I think that, that number will just go up. And I've talked fast, so Martin, go ahead. Yeah, so I will <clears throat> introduce the demo, and uh, especially the demo topologies. You will see <clears throat> it's basically simulating uh, DC-like environment with every, every protocols we use there. Uh, it's um, running in a lab just to be able to deploy it from scratch, but <clears throat> it's more or less the same. Uh, two, two devices we are not touching are the core devices at the, at the top of the picture because it's already existing environment and they are serving more than just our lab. So <clears throat> we were not able to zeroize those and uh, redeploy those because we would cause an outage with that. But uh, all the stuff uh, bottom from those uh, is... Uh, is in this demo completely zeroized. It's a uh, like a box you you would take from the or unpack from the from the box and uh, just rack it, connect it, and um, <coughs> then 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 you would deploy it. So what we have here is uh, MPLS and EVPN mixed uh, infrastructure where we are using EVPN for uh, layer two and layer three um, routing for for VLANs, uh, extending the VLAN. Um, so we have we have no L2 uh, spanning three domain more or less. It's all it's all routed. Uh, all the links you have, you can see are routed, and uh, for that we use BGP route reflectors on the core, and uh, all the all the devices are connected there. Um, in this case, we are also using uh, stateless firewalls, <coughs> more or less. Uh, <coughs> I'm sorry. 
more or less uh, for blacklisting and they are connected via MPLS to extend all the VRS from the distribution layer up to the up to the firewalls and uh, uh, then, then then use the, the <coughs> logic there. Uh, on the core, we, we don't have any of those VRFs that we have on the distribution layer because they are connected just to the <coughs> underlay infrastructure. <coughs> now I will show you the demo recording. It's uh, quite a lot of deployment and I wanted to be sure that uh, it's, it works as it should. So we have, uh, we have that record. Um, let me just stop it right here and uh, show you. Basically, you can see that uh, devices are in amnesiac mode. I'm showing that on the console. Um, going through all the devices, all, all six of them, um, all of those are amnesiac. Uh, that's a Juniper mode when you unbox it. It's basically empty switch. Empty switch, yes, without any configuration. Um, I don't know if this is visible uh, um, at the back. It's recording. I will show that after the recording because I have the. This is basically a static file, so I will show that and go through the through the file with a bigger font. I didn't realize when recording that it might not be visible for guys in the in the back row. <coughs> so, what's this? It's a YAML abstraction layer for us that we use. Um, it's. Uh, it helps us to define the um, relationship between devices and devices uh, on its own um, in, within the campus with uh, abstracting multiple things <coughs> like, uh, as I mentioned, MPLS, EVPN, we just set that flag to the true and then we have all the standards in the background uh, that they are basically doing the connection for us. Uh, relationship between devices, we, we basically uh, say how it's connected to the core layer. Uh, we define all the VLANs and stuff like that. Uh, <coughs> and this is basically just uh, scrolling down through the two devices. You can see that uh, it's a lot of work in the uh, in, up front before deploying the device, but st still it's not that difficult like creating whole configuration before you deploy that. It's uh, <coughs> a lot of abstraction uh, or abstract. Um, one thing I would like to highlight here, let me just move that up the other side. <coughs> or I will show it here so it's better visible. So what, was, what has been shown uh, is that MPLS EVPN, we set that like to the true. Uh, we set telemetry to true to, to get the monitoring up and running. Uh, this is nicely visible how abstract it is. Uh, we basically define BGP domain, but we don't define any peers, any neighbors, uh, because uh, the, the factor behind and our logic behind just finds other, other uh, BGP peers within the campus and defines all the IP addresses and how they are, sh they, they are connected together. Um, it figures all the IP addresses because, because it has all the facts. Um, so we just define, uh, this is client for this route reflector domain. Uh, on the core, we have a uh, route reflector server, and that's it. <coughs> we are heavily using uh, includes uh, within, within the campus files, because you can imagine uh, a YAML file uh, where you are defining uh, ports for a device, and it can be a stack of 10 members, 48 ports. It would be 480 definitions for each port, and it can grow pretty fast. So. Uh, we are heavily using includes. In include, you define uh, more or less the, the VLANs uh, with their specific VRF. Uh, you can see that we are not defining, even though we are using eVPN, we are not defining any VRRP IP address or something like that. Again, it happens on the background <coughs> because we have a standard for that. And I wanted to show you uh, how the including can actually help you simplify the work. Let's say we have uh, two firewalls in the picture, and uh, the firewalls should be defined uh, the same. So policy should be the same, filters should be the same. VRF, tunnels, because uh, for route, le route leaking we are using tunnels, and VRFs 
<coughs> all that thing should be the same on both firewalls and I can put it to one include file and just include it on the two devices in the network or more of them. And uh, when I'm adding or removing ACL or whatever, I, I do it on multiple devices at the same time. <coughs> That's uh, how including helps. And now, let me just, it's skipping too fast. So yeah, let, let's just continue in the demo. Just scrolling through the same file. Um, yep, and now, now we will move to the Ansible Tower itself. I will stop it right there. So in the in the Ansible Tower, uh, for this use case for the for the demo, I created a workflow template, uh, something similar that we we are using elsewhere as well. Uh, but specifically just to those devices that you, you have seen on the topology. Um, the workflow template uh, is, uh, consists uh, from two job templates. Uh, it's basically deploy IT lab and then update, update the monitoring. Um, and when we launch it, Yeah. So it takes a little bit of time for running. It's uh, deploying over the console, which is uh, kind of slow. But I'm going to show you on the one console because we are using, as, as Igor mentioned, we are using Open Gear, and when you connect there on the console interface, um, you can see what what other person is pushing. It's basically using a screen for that console. So I'm going to show you part of that uh, communication be between Ansible Tower and, uh, and the device itself. Now you can see it's uh, verifying. First it verifies the serial number so it knows that we are pushing to the correct device um, because the cabling can be messed up and you don't want to uh, reconfigure different device uh, on the network. And then uh, it moves to the deployment and it basically, without us touching anything, it uh, pushes all the configuration there. Um, and of course, I'm not showing you full configuration because there are hashes of passwords and, and stuff like that. So uh, I will move just to, to different screen in a few. But uh, so as just you can see the, the diff that it actually is pushing something that we are not. <coughs> yeah, just to refresh the Danceable uh, tower job to show you that uh, how it how it looks like there. Uh, it's basically just set of tasks uh, that are being uh, executed. Uh, some of those uh, for checking checking a serial number, opening SSH tunnels uh, to the console server. Um, come on. So here you can see that uh, we are already getting a diff. And now in, in, uh, in a few, it should, it should just uh, appear green um, that, that the job was executed uh, properly and, and uh, successfully ended. And with that, we will have uh, uh, all the six devices deployed. And uh, then we are moving to updating, monitoring uh, based on, the, on that. And uh, as you've seen in the campus file, we just uh, set one attribute to true, and that's it for the monitoring. It figures all the stuff, uh, again, in background. That's a uh, that's, uh, nice uh, thing, you, what you get if you go full standard and full automation. <coughs> and uh, especially if you, get, uh, if you have a single source of truth, as Igor mentioned, you can then use it for mul multiple things. And as uh, the automation knows about all the details about the device, uh, it can pass it easily to the monitoring, and monitoring then knows uh, what exactly should be monitored according to our standard. So all the point-to-point -point links between devices, uh, BGP if it's running there, um, it should know what what, actually, what IP address is to check. Uh, if we are monitoring link utilization to external links like uh, VPLS, one connectivity, uh, whatever else, uh, it knows about it. 
Uh, this is this is a running campus, and I am showing here that uh, there is no other campus in the monitoring because the BRQ lab is going to be deployed in a few. So uh, you, what what you have seen is basically the testing environment, another development environment we have, <coughs> and uh, the you can see that there was a commit uh, success. So. The configuration was committed. That's how it's done on Junipers. And uh, pushing the monitoring takes a little bit more time because it's uh, going through the files and creating all the, all the configuration files on the server. So in meantime, I'm connected to uh, one of the devices. And as you can see, uh, you have BGP established for, for uh, more, more or less two minutes, already exchanging. Uh, yeah, exchanging BGP VPN uh, information, L3 VPN for MPLS. All the VRFs that we have, we have there. Um, in our, there are appearing some of the point-to-point -point IP addresses and stuff like that. And now you can see um, that we already have some MAC addresses uh, on the VTAP shared by shared by uh, eVPN. So. That's, that's more or less complicated or complex infrastructure, running all these protocols, running, running BGP, EVPN, e MPLS together in one campus. Uh, it takes a lot of time to deploy that manually, and we have done that in uh, less than six minutes uh, in this case. And here you can see that on the monitoring side, it basically created uh, six, six files, six configuration files, for, for Janiper SNMP monitoring. Um, well, it's called Janiper SNMP, but we are slowly moving to GRPC, which is faster, and you can go down uh, below one minute interval when, when uh, getting, getting uh, metrics uh, from, from network devices, and even more than uh, SNMP offers to be even faster when uh, recognizing an issue. And uh, now it's uh, pushing also some other configuration or uh, more or less validating it's there. Uh, but in, in a few, it will just restart the monitoring service. And uh, I think I paused the recording for a little bit because it, it takes, I don't know, uh, one or two minutes to, have, uh, to, to get some information in the, in the monitoring itself. And then... Um, uh, on the on the right side, as you can see, the system info. Um, it take it, we, we collect that every ten minutes. So I po post that, so you can see it's it appears there. This just let's fin let's wait for the job to finish. I. Usually, when you do automation like this, you just execute the job, and you can go drink coffee. Drink coffee or smoke, based on the preference. <coughs> so. Yeah, it takes a little bit of time, uh, especially restarting the the monitoring service. It's I'm showing here that uh, other devices were deployed as well. This one was, this one had a st stuck console. Um, it happens time to time that you, you need to log out. Um, when, when using Ansible Tower, when we, uh, when we were using CLI tool, uh, it didn't happen. So that's something that we need to figure as well. So I just unstuck it and, and uh, just log out from the console and, and uh, it was basically uh, immediately in the working state. Well, it was wor in working state before, just the console access was stuck. And uh, in a few, the, the, the campus should appear in the monitoring. Just let's wait for, for monitoring to notice it. Continue drinking your coffee. Yeah, 
It's the, it's the thing. Uh, in this in this demo, we are using SNMP, and we have uh, one minute intervals for for the SNMP. So it takes uh, around one minute to to, no, to for monitoring to notice that. And you can see that we have also already some some devices appearing in the monitoring. And when we pick one, you can see that it already picked some information. Still waiting for something like uh, interface utilization, interface errors. But we have. Uh, at least the links information, so we know about the uplink, we know that about the state it's up, we know about the CPU memory, we know about BGP neighbors that uh, both neighbors are established in established state. We have also <coughs> a diagram of how it looked like for last hour, and uh, now I will move to the. And so, so I can show you that it's collecting, yeah. And now you can see that it collected also the system information, including uh, model latency, software version, and uh, uptime. In a few, it will collect also the host name and all that information about the device. <coughs> so that's that's more or less uh, um, how we deployed DC-like environment. Uh, consisting of six devices um, in how much was that in more or less 10 minutes 11 minutes so hey. now can it's your time to announce that can you change to the, uh, yeah yeah I think it's more or less Q&A yep so Q&A guys any questions? Um, how many times does this actually say or rectify the real network problem? Um, so far, uh, well, you mean in a, in a, in a, in a self-healing way, in an automated way? Not yet. That's, that's, the, that's the part where when we were actually writing <coughs> the what was the, the, the abstract for this presentation. We were, we were hoping to be there for this presentation, but we are, we are missing the last piece when I said we need to connect the three parts, which is always something that we, we want to do it. So that's, we have not done that, but we are very close in order to connect the dots. As you've seen, we, are, we have the network monitoring, we have the Ansible tower, we just need to uh, connect the dots, do a logic, let's see what, what are the types where we need to actually do that and, 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 and kind of test it. So, so far, none. But it has helped us a lot when we actually have a problem or where we actually, uh, you know, manually using it in order to, in an automated fashion, fix problems. Like, we need to, you know, add an access list somewhere on the, you know, large infrastructure, we can easily do that. Now we are actually using that. But not in a in a self healing way. We are we are missing the last step to actually connect the dots. We have the infrastructure. We have the monitoring. We have the Ansible tower. We need to connect that connect that stuff together. So you will just run some or you know break the network somehow to test it or add a, add a network loop and see how it manages it. That's that's probably how we'll try. We won't try it in production. I mean, we as Martin has we we have a lab and we we have environments where we can test that. So. We are. We brought the Ansible tower up and running. We have the network monitoring. We just need to start alerting and then use use that to, to, to make some logic. I mean, uh, we have a, a lot of labs within Red Hat, so it won't be a problem to start testing that. If we even have our lab as an IT. We have labs where we can we can play and test test scenarios like this, and that's probably where I mean. Uh, Automation and self-healing is scary because you really can break stuff, on it, you know. So that's that stuff that we really would like to test some of the stuff and 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 and, and before putting them in production. Thanks. Any other questions? Well, we are a team of, I don't know, 15? Something like that. 15? So, I would say the people that are 
so the active developers, Martin, the actual folks that uh, know a lot more about it, we have probably, uh, I would say, two, three folks. And a lot of folks actually using it and trying to you know, uh, help and implement, implement stuff. And that's, that's part of the, we started with one person and we're slowly growing that, changing the mindset of the people that they are not just you know, pure network engineers, but they need to, to know. Because this tool will fall apart if people are not using it or not updating. <coughs> we, for example, we implement a, a new vendor or a new platform, a new Juniper switch or whatever, we need to figure out how that will plug in so that we can continue to work. So the ratio is, is not great, but I think uh, the adoption is, is, is good. So people are starting to use it and people are actually, you know, have enough skill set to actually find problems and fix, fix it by themselves, I would say. Um, if I may add, when we were showing this slide, so the adoption is uh, pretty good because uh, on the Juniper side, we did 20 or 30 percent, uh, last 20 of, or 30 percent that, that you can see there uh, <coughs> in the uh, last two months or so. So I, again, the, the adoption <coughs> is, is, is great and that's, that's the critical part that I mentioned that for people using or trying to do this, you really need, you know, managers <coughs> to actually try to convince people, hey guys, this is why, and again, I mean, it, it, you're dealing with people. People are scared, but they need to they need to know something new. And it's kind of like, oh my God, I'm going to get out of a job. No, you're not going to get out of a job. But this is a this is a tool where it actually can help your job to be easier, help us as a team to actually deliver more and faster. You know, uh, as as any IT, uh, we get more and more infrastructure. We don't get more and more people. It's not scalable. So we need to figure out ways how to do it faster or smarter. And again, you are you are upgrading your skills to actually do, you know, uh, be ahead, you know, or catching up with industry more or less, like SDN and code define and stuff like that. So that's that's the part of the journey where we were actually uh, changing the mindset. Questions? You, I think, had. Yes. Uh, what EGP protocol <coughs> or uh, application are you using? Is it Pocket or? Uh, you know, to actually do the BGP uh, <coughs> protocol. We use the standard BGP in Juniper. We don't use, uh, we use the... So it's not running on the rail, it's just running on the switches? Yes, yes. This is a uh, physical network infrastructure model. Okay. So this is, this is the, yeah, this, these are physical devices by Juniper <coughs> or Cisco or whatever, and we're just abstracting the configuration and making sure we are templating and standardizing the configuration. So we're using the... The normal way a normal network engineer will configure a device, we're just typing commands, we're just doing it in a more automated and abstracted way. Alright, fair enough, thanks. Uh, can you mention some detail about the technology between the description files and the uh, answer tower? Yeah, that's, uh, I think, question for me. Um, so, more or less, what we are using on the background is, uh, as you could see, uh, the YAML files that are providing us with this uh, abstraction layer and uh, giving the facts about the infrastructure uh, from network engineers <coughs> to the tool. Then we have so-called factor, uh, which is taking those, those YAML files um, and uh, extending those facts with uh, some added logic. So as I mentioned, uh, <coughs> finding uh, another peers within the BGP route reflector group um, creating uh, or adding point-to-point -point IP addresses because we have all that standardized so everything we had in, in our head how to create those standards how to do that uh, that's now moved to the to the factor that are that is taking those facts extending them <coughs> sorry that is then taken uh, by dynamic inventory of Ansible and uh, Ansible is then taking those facts uh, and creating plain text uh, configuration files using Jinja2 templates that we created. And those, those uh, configurations are then pushed to the device. Uh, what we are doing uh, with every run, we are basically replacing whole configuration to make sure 
that uh, the configuration is standardized, nothing that was manually added is there, and uh, it's according to, to the source of uh, truth. Any other questions? What, what do we? So you, you showed us that you use Grafana for monitoring, but what do you use for Kayak? For what, sorry? Kayak, I mean, when something pops up. For, oh, alerting. for alerting. Okay, got it. <coughs> you want to answer that? Or yeah, yeah. Or? so for, for alerting, uh, I mean for the creating events, uh, we use Capacitor, uh, which is consuming uh, stream data from Telegraph, which is collecting those metrics. Um, it's on the one, on the one side. It's creating events based on the, some thresholds, uh, but it's all, also uh, pushing back to the database all the SLI, SLOs, uh, statistics that we are we have defined, <coughs> so that we, we then can the, we then can visualize those things uh, for the management and, and business partners to basically show them how we are standing. Uh, <clears throat> that those alerts are then, or those events are then uh, pushed to the event management, which is uh, more or less page duty for us at this moment, and then basically alerting us. Anyone else? Is the initial setup of the adapter also in some way already related? So at one point, the device is basically empty. Well, what we showed on the demo was the device was completely empty. Like you're unpacking it, the only need, like you, we're, all we needed is a local hands to connect it to console. And then we push everything via console. We actually have, the actual tool allows us to, to use multiple <coughs> ways. Like if, if we, do, for example, don't have console access for whatever reason, someone will just type in the management IP address and via management we have an option to do the same. But the purpose is for exactly that. It's like empty box, you plug it, Give console and we push everything. So new data center we have you know what not twenty switches. They rack it, they connect console, we push what we push now and more or less we have everything up and running. Then. Yeah, just keep the console like this. Yes. Well you, you know which which uh, which switch should be connected to which port on the on the out of band management. And you just so, any, any, yeah. yeah, I would I would just give there an example. You can imagine that you are setting a whole new data center, and uh, you have network engineer who knows what what uh, platforms and what devices were chosen for that project, and he says uh, or he defines in the YAML file this is how it should be connected together, without taking care, care of uh, serial numbers and uh, that that, that uh, missing piece, um, but he defines all the stuff there. Then uh, the tool, of course, has a uh, capability of exporting wiring map. So you can give that wiring map to uh, your local hands in the data center. Then they go, rack all the stuff, connect it how, how you defined that before. Uh, they can fill into the tool all the serial numbers because they know about those. And they can execute the job uh, on their own because uh, it, uh, it's just a matter of someone executing it because it was defined before. And the net network engineer then can consume that uh, infrastructure when it's fully deployed. Uh, so we might have to ask you right? Yep. Uh, how can all these devices end up in an inventory? Is it manual work to add it into the inventory? So something that covers us to discover <laughs> the device? It does the dynamic inventory, dynamic inventory does that. It discovers uh, all the campuses, it calls the factor on all those campuses, and it consumes those facts, more or less. So uh, the dynamic inventory just calls uh, the, the factor which sits uh, somewhere, somewhere else and uh, consumes all the facts at the end. Any other questions? In that case, I would just add to the last question, if I may. <clears throat> With uh, having all the facts, um, you have one, one huge advantage for, for uh, in, having those facts in, in uh, inventory uh, as host wars, 
you see an opportunity to use uh, small inventories, smart inventories in Ansible Tower, and basically call the job just on limited set of devices. I don't know. Uh, let's say we have security incident, and you need to uh, fast implement some ACL to block that. You can say Ansible Tower uh, just ex execute this job on uh, all the edge firewalls in our network, and it goes based on the facts, it knows what those firewalls are, and just updates it. Done? Yep. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys.